This morning, our scripture reading is from Revelation chapter 22, again this week, and uh, we read this last week, we're going to read it again this week, and we will read it next week because we are looking at three of the I Am statements of Jesus himself, and we are going to be reading in Revelation chapter 22 from verses 12 down to verse 17, so if you have a Bible, I invite you to grab that and read with me now. Revelation 22. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay each one for what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter by the gates of the city. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, and the sexually immoral, and murderers, and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride, they say, come, and let all who hear say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. And this is the word of the Lord this morning. And the word for this week is king. We're going to be focusing our attention in on this singular concept and word, kingship. It's a word that carries with it a freight of meaning. You know, it, it, it's loaded like a boat that's going across the ocean from China and delivering goods to us. The crown, a symbol of power and influence, of wealth and prestige, of humble service. To win in chess, you must checkmate your opponent's king. That's the piece that has to ultimately be taken down to win. And this week, I asked my wife and my two kids, What's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word king? Julie said, crown, authority, ruler, and might. Georgia said to me, God, royalty, respect, and responsibility. Beautiful words. Micah said, control, command, and power that can be used for both good or bad to rule either wisely or in an evil way. Wisdom from my children. I love it. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, Jesus says, I am the root and the descendant of David. I am the king of kings says Jesus. And here, when Jesus says this in the book of Revelation, he is hearkening all the way back to the Old Testament in the books of First and Second Samuel. So Jesus here is looking back to the story of King David, the life of King David in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. We see this life of a man a man whose heart was for God. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, God says to the prophet Samuel, fill your horn with oil and go. Go, I will send you to Jesse in Bethlehem, to a man, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And so God himself has chosen for himself a ruler among his people who will be a son of Jesse. And Jesse's youngest son, David, was just a boy at the time. He was a shepherd. He was out with the sheep. He was the youngest. He was insignificant. 
Nobody really even knew about David until the Creator God said, He is the one. Go, Samuel, and anoint Him. He is the one that I have chosen. And the text says this in 1 Samuel 16. That day, when David was anointed, the Spirit of the Lord, it rushed upon him and it remained with him. The Spirit of the Lord filled David, anointed him for this task that was still yet to come years and years later, decades later in his life, but God put his seal on him. God looked on David's heart and he saw a man who sought after him. And so he chose him. And why did he choose him? He chose him for the purpose to wisely rule his people. To be a humble king. To be one who would come among the people and serve. Not seek to be served, but to serve. And David ruled for 40 years. He ruled for the longest in the Israel and the line of the kings came from his lineage. He made Jerusalem the capital in Judah and he established the stronghold of Mount Zion. And so in all of the scriptures, in the Psalms, in all of the praise that we read so often in worship, the stronghold of Zion, that comes because David chose an anointed, sorry, God chose David and anointed him to be king. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 16, we read these powerful words. God himself establishes an everlasting covenant with David. And he says these words, When your days are fulfilled, David, and you lie down with your fathers, I will rise up offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish my kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will never depart from him, as I took it from Saul, who I put away from before you. And your house, David, and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, says the Lord. Your throne shall be established forever. That is God's promise. That is God's promise to David, and it is his promise to his line. And so now, we're going to weave this story through the prophet Isaiah again this week, just like we did last week, and then we're going to come into the Gospels. So over 400 years later, the line of Israel's kings have descended into darkness. The kings have turned away from God, by and large, and the people of God are turning away from Him. So then, God sends prophets, and amidst the darkness of His people, He sends the prophet Isaiah. We've heard words from Isaiah this morning already. Just over in chapter 11, we hear this prophecy. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. So God's people have been laid low. They are under God's discipline. However, God's promise endures. Out of the stump of Jesse, a branch shall emerge. From its roots, there shall be fruit And the Spirit of Yahweh God, the Spirit of the Creator and the covenant-keeping God, He will rest upon this King in the kingly line. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. It will rest upon Him. In that day, the root of Jesse, it will stand and it will stand as a signal to all of the peoples of the earth The promise will extend out into the nations. The nations will seek Him, and He will gather the dispersed of Judah from all over the earth. The prophecy of Isaiah, spoken hundreds of years after David was dead, and hundreds of years before Christ, the King, ever came. 
And then we look forward another 600 years. And before Jesus is even born, the angel of the Lord comes to Mary, announcing good news. And we see these words. We read these words in Luke chapter 1. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus. So you see the theme of sonship emerging from Samuel to Isaiah to the Gospels to the prophecy of Christ's coming. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and he will be great and he will be called the Son of of the Most High, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will have no end. The New, New Testament itself, in Matthew chapter 1, 1, opens with these words. The genealogy of Jesus... Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham. And so, with the coming of Christ, the Old Testament prophecy is fulfilled. A thousand years of God's word speaking to his people. God declaring his prophetic word. And here in the person, in the face of Jesus, we see the king of the Jews, born in Bethlehem, David's royal City, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. Lord of all, come down into a lowly stable, a humble beginning, a humble king who will rule his people, redeeming love in the face of a newborn child, light from heaven, come down to earth to show light in the darkness of our human experience. God with us, Jesus, son of David. And then, when, David, when Jesus grows up and he begins his ministry, how does he begin his ministry? What word does he come proclaiming? He comes proclaiming a message of repentance. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom that was promised to David and his line, is at hand. And so turn, turn to me and follow God. That's what Jesus says, Matthew 4, 17. You read the Gospels. The poor and the sick, they come to Jesus. And what do they say to him? Son of David, have mercy on us. Son of David, you are the promised one. To you we look. To you we look for healing and we look for deliverance. And then Jesus rides into Jerusalem in the final week of his life. The humble king mounted on a colt bringing peace. And again, what is the response of the people of God? Mark chapter 11. The people cry out, Hosanna, praise be to your name. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom, you guessed it, of our father David. That's the praise that comes forth from the people's lips. Hosanna. Praise be to God in the highest because the promise is fulfilled and he is with us. He is our deliverer. And when Jesus is finally crowned king, in his sacrificial death on the cross, what is the sign that is fixed over Jesus' head? Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And so we see in Jesus' whole entire life, this proclamation, this testimony, that this is the true King. This is the one that God promised He comes from this line. And my salvation, says the Lord, will go out into the world through him. 
And then we loop ourselves back, all the way back around the, to the book of Revelation, the final word in the word of God. And in chapter 5 of the book of Revelation, we read these words. In this heavenly throne room vision, all of creation, the people of God, worshiping Him, pouring out praise, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has won the victory by His blood. He has ransomed a people for God from every tribe, from every language, from every people, from every nation on earth, and made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall rule with Him. The entire story of kingship and God's rulership comes back around. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is declared the King of kings and the Lord of lords, chapter 19. And as we read at the beginning of this sermon, Jesus Himself says, I am the root and the descendant of David. And so, in the authority of the Father, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus fulfills this story of redemption. He is the true King. He is Israel's royal Messiah. He is the world's rightful Lord. Jesus is light of the nations. God's true and faithful Son. Bringing the kingdom of His Father into this world. Establishing the kingdom of God on hev- in the earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is the man. He is the center of everything. And He has made us into a kingdom of priests who serve our Father. And so we, we are called to live under the rule of the King. We look at the Scriptures. We look at this unbelievable story spanning thousands of years, running 2,000 years beyond when Jesus walked this earth. The Spirit of the living God breathing life into as many people as possible, as many people will res- who will respond to this message and who will live as children of the King. We are children of the King. Because of Jesus. We are God's servants. The message doesn't just end with Jesus sitting on a throne. It continues on with Jesus ruling and reigning in our lives. Because we are his children. Called to follow him. Called to live into his light. To live under his wise and loving rule to submit our lives, to humble ourselves, and to worship at the foot of the cross in the power of the Holy Spirit sent out to serve, no matter our age. I told you this morning, I ask my children, I seek their counsel, what do do you think? What do you hear from the Spirit when I say to you the word King? The Lord, the one who rules in my life, and I'm called to serve Him. No matter your age, no matter your social standing, no matter how you perceive yourself in this world, whether you think that you're way down here, or whether you think that you're way up here, listen this morning, God calls you to serve Him where you are in your life. Where you are right now, this moment, this season, not where you want to be, not where you wish you were, but right here. Whether you are a stay-at-home mom and you're wondering, 
My life is so simple. Where, where's my impact in this world? It's in my home. Jesus is ruling and reigning right in that place. A homemaker. One of the most important callings and vocations in this world. The world can look down on these things. God exalts these things. Raising children who worship the king. What a vocation. It doesn't matter if you're a teacher, if you're a student, if you're a lawyer, a doctor, a nurse, an engineer, a business person, you run a small business, you're worried right now. Is my business going to survive in all this mess of COVID? God has a plan for you. The king is at work in your life. And he's calling you to serve. And how do we serve? In all of these different places, in all of these different vocations, we serve by embracing the virtues of the kingdom. The virtues of the king. Love. Peace. Hospitality. An offering of service to other people. Mercy. Hope. We embrace the message of hope. And we don't get caught in despair. We offer grace. We offer kindness. We offer peace. The virtues of the kingdom. For you and for me, where we are, where God has us. And of course, we will ever only do this partially. We fail. We fall. As a parent, you can ask my children once again, am I perfect? Not a chance in this world. Does every single one of us fail? Does everyone, every single one of us fall down? Are we always faithful followers of the king? No. But you want to know what? His rule and his reign endures even in the midst of our disobedience. Even in the midst of our falling and stumbling. He is there. And so we get up and we try again. We lean into his strength. We persevere. We trust our king to lift us up and to exalt us. And we follow him. And so I want to close this morning with a story. I want to bring this into a life and a situation, not in, you know, comfortable Canada. I want to tell a story about Tim Costello. He was the CEO at that point in time of World Vision Australia. And he tells this story in his book, Faith. Tim went to uh, Syria in 2013. Now, if you remember... Uh, and I know we don't hear this on the news, unfortunately, anymore because everything's focused on a few isolated things. But there's still a, a, a major problem in Syria, in the Middle East. So if you rewind the clock back a little bit and you think back uh, seven years ago, it was a disaster in Syria. A total war zone. Refugees everywhere by the millions. And so Tim goes and he's visiting Syrian refugee camps and he's trying to see how the work of World Vision is going and how the work of other organizations is going in Syria in the midst of an absolute disaster, a crisis of humanity. And he was terribly discouraged. I mean, this is darkness. And he is feeling hopeless. You know, the needs are endless. The injustice is unspeakable. The stream of refugees never ends. Where do you start? And so Tim, he takes a walk. He's got to clear his head one night. And he, his heart is weighed down. And so he's walking the streets. And all of a sudden, he sees a guy. There, there, he owns a house. I guess he's in a neighborhood. And this guy randomly just calls him over. 
hey, what are you doing, buddy? Come on over. Do you want to come in for a coffee? So this guy's name is Milak, a stranger, a stranger in the night. He invites Tim in for coffee, and as Tim's coming up to uh, the front of his house, there's kind of a garden, and over there, you know, people have gardens in front of their houses, and they hang out, and they mingle. They mingle with people. And so when he goes up, there's six guys that are sitting there at night, around a fire, an open fire at night, outside, and they're drinking coffee. Six Syrian refugees with Milak. And so Tim comes in, and they start chatting, and he explains to, to Tim that these six guys had nowhere to go, they had nothing to do, they were refugees. And so he took them in, six men, he took them into his house, and he gave them work at his plant. And he had a business building solar panels. And so he gave them work and he gave them a place to live. And they had now been living with him for six months, Syrian refugees. And after some conversation, Malak shared how his Christian belief is what had motivated him to offer this radical expression of hospitality to these men who had nowhere to go and no hope. It wasn't just out of the goodness of the guy's heart. It was the king working in his heart that motivated him to offer hospitality, to say, I have to do something. I can't just sit here. Guided by the Holy Spirit to share life, listen to this, with six Muslim refugees, different worldview, different ideology, different outlook on life, different politics, different way of praying. Come into my house. Let me offer you hospitality. Why? Because you are struggling, and if I don't take you in, you might die. King Jesus is the one who leads us to do these kinds of things. Milak, the good Samaritan. That's how Tim ends the story in his book. Something clicks in his mind. And he remembers the story of the good Samaritan. The guy's left on the road. And he's in complete despair. He's been beaten, left for dead. And there's lots of people that pass by. You know, the religious leaders, the Republicans... The, pe the people who are big, who think they're big, they pass guy by, they leave him for dead. And then there's a guy that comes, and he takes him, and he gets him shelter, and he heals, gets his wounds healed, gets the guy all healed up, and off he goes. The Good Samaritan. Living into God's kingdom vision. Malak. Offering the radical hospitality of Jesus to those who are in need. We are called to be servants of the King. Not in perfect circumstances, but in the mess of life. I've heard it said, when life hurls rocks at you, collect them, and then build a highway out of the rocks, and march down the highway. And serve, be of use, be of value. My friends, God welcomes us into his royal court. But God does not welcome us into his royal court so that we can just stay there and enjoy things for ourselves in peaceful individuality. God calls us into his royal court he brings us under His loving rule so that He can send us back out into this world as servants of the King. That is the message of the Gospel, of the good news of Jesus, of Advent, of Christmas. That's the good news of the season that we're journeying through right now. We are sent by God's Spirit to offer the genera generosity of the king to those who are in need. 
we are welcomed by the king to be sent. And we are sent to serve in Christ's power. A power, a redemptive force that brings transformation to every part of our lives. To every part of this world. That's the message. That's the good news. So don't keep it for yourself. Yes, we can do our devotions during Advent and Christmas. We can rejoice. We can celebrate with family and friends. But don't leave it there. Take it out. It's good news. It is the transforming power of God. And it will bring new life and new creation in a world that desperately needs us. This is who we are in Christ our King. Let us live into this vision with boldness and humility. And would you pray with me? Lord, we just want to take a moment and quiet our hearts. We want to absorb, Lord, your word. Father, you've taken us through your word thousands of years. story of your presence, that you are our king, that you are our God, and that you call us to be a kingdom of priests who serve you, servants, Lord. We want to be your servants. Help us, Father, just in these moments, to consider, Lord, what does this mean for me? What are you calling me to, Father? What are you calling us to as a church, Lord, in this time, not in the time that we wish that we had, But in this time, what kind of a people, Lord, are you calling us to be? Shape us, O Father, into a kingdom people. A people who pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, not just in heaven, but we pray that the kingdom will come on earth. We pray, come Lord Jesus. We align ourselves with the word of the book of Revelation. Come Lord Jesus. Manifest your presence in our midst. Bring new life, Lord. Heal the sick. Feed the poor. Clothe the naked. Lord, fill the downcast with good things. And do it through us, Father. I pray that we would not be spectators in this. But that we would be your servants, Lord. Your instruments of peace working in our time for racial racial justice in the midst of injustice. The healing of tribal division. The healing of our lands. 
the healing of your world, of countries, Lord, of people's lives, seeing each other as your children. Have mercy, Lord. Comfort, Lord, your persecuted people. Bring hope. And Jesus, make us instruments of your peace. Help us to love one another as you've loved us. Your kingdom, O Lord, it is close at hand. And so we pray. Come, Lord Jesus.